Chapter 35 We entered into a large room in which a few small tallow candles had been stuck into crannies in the walls. Despite the sputtering light, it was a dim and smoky place that reeked of bad ale, stale bread, and sour wine. Trestle tables and benches, more than I had ever seen in one place, stood beneath a low-beamed ceiling. The floor was made of thick wood slabs, strewn with dirty rushes. To one side stood a kind of counter, upon which sat rows of wooden tankards. Behind this counter stood a large buxom woman, dressed in a brown, grease-spotted kirtle. She had a lopsided white linen cap upon her dark and gray-streaked tresses. Around her waist was a belt of glassy rosary beads, from which dangled a leather purse. Wooden pattens were on her feet. As for her face, it was a flushed and rosy red. Her nose was flat, as if it had once been broken. Her cheeks were sunken, too. Withal, she cast off a brimming, bustling force. When we came forward, she squinted to see who was there. As Bear loomed large before her, a grand grin spread upon her face, revealing not just joy, but a complete lack of teeth. "'God's wounds!' she cried with lipsing, spittle-spaying laughter. "'It's the bear set loose among us again!' "'And on my honor, Bear said, his voice booming, his arms spread wide. "'It's the widow Devontree. The two embraced in the middle of the room. "'Welcome back to Great Wexley,' the woman said, pushing Bear away, even as she looked him up and down. "'I was wondering if you'd come. But you've been true.' "'Fair lady,' Bear laughed, making a mock bow. "'I always keep my word.' "'But once again, sir, I fear you've not come to court me,' she said. "'Alas, it's my other business,' he said. Then, to my astonishment, the woman smote him hard in the chest with a tight fist, a blow which only made him laugh even more. Not content with that assault, she pulled his beard and tweaked his cheek. "'And what escapades have befallen you since you were last here?' she asked, laughing with such delight that I could not keep from grinning too. "'Many an adventure, you can be sure,' he said. "'And there stands one of them,' Bear pointed to me. The woman turned and considered me with squinty eyes. "'Is he yours, or did you find him in some swamp?' Before he answered, Bear looked around. What he might have been searching for, I don't know, for only the three of us were there. "'It was God's sweet grace that let him find me.' "'How did it happen?' "'We met in an abandoned village. He had fled his village.' Did he? the woman said, and looked at me with new interest. For what reason? In such of a grander world, said Bear. And what of his father, his mother? Both gone to a better world. An orphan, then, and not pursued? she asked, clearly relishing the tale. That's another matter, Bear said, with a frown. But by the laws of this realm, he said, he's fully bound to me now, my apprentice, and a likely lad. It felt good to, hear, good to hear his praise. "'What's your name?' she asked me. I made myself look up. "'It's Crispin.' "'Now there's a high-born na name for a lowly lad,' the woman said. "'But Crispin, pay no heed to my bantering. There's friends are mine. Welcome to the Green Man's Inn. Where do you come from?' When I hesitated, Bear said, "'Crispin, name your village.' "'Stromford,' I said.' Never heard of it, the woman said with a shrug. One of Lord Furnival's holdings, Bear said. Hm, Lord Furnival, the woman said, turning from me back to Bear. Have you not heard the news? That Lord Furnival died, he said. Aye, two weeks ago, the woman said. As Bear made the sign of the cross over his heart, I said, How did you know? Not sure which surprised me more, that he had known or that he hadn't told me. The black cloth draped around town, he replied, and the extra soldiers at the gates. To be sure, the woman said, when great men die, there's always unrest. He died in his bed, she added. From the wounds he earned at the French wars, I suppose it will only encourage your enterprise, she said with some unease. Widow, he said, it's not my enterprise. As I watched and listened to the two of them, it was clear she had more knowledge of Bear in his business than I. It gave me a jealous pang. "'Who will succeed the Lord?' Bear said. "'He has no legal heirs,' the woman said, "'though it's been rumoured there are some illegitimate ones.' "'And all his property?' "'It now belongs to his widow, the Lady Furnival.' 
unless some bastard's son with an army at his back makes a claim, or until she marries, if she marries, but they say that's unlikely. She's not the type to relinquish her new powers. She never travelled with Lord Furnival, but preferred to stay in her court. You know what women say, she added with a grin. If the first marriage is a gift from God, the second comes straight from hell. That said, there was an awkward moment of silence. Bear was tense. I did not know exactly what had occurred, but it made me recall something Father Quinnell had told me once at confession. A moment of silence in the midst of talk means death's angel is close at hand. I shuddered. Chapter 36 But you, she said to Bear, must sit and slake your thirst. I want to know all you've learned since you've last been here. Bear relaxed. If you'll be so good as to fetch me the key to my room in the solar, the special one, he added, I'll settle the boy, then we can speak. Though realizing I was being put aside, I said nothing, but simply followed Bear. Key in one hand, he led me up the steps to the second story. I had never climbed so high in a building before, so high that I furtively put a hand to the wall to steady myself. We went along a dark, narrow hallway until we reached a door, which he unlocked. Our Sola, he informed me. Go on. I stepped inside. By the little light that seeped through a shuttered window, I observed a small room. Old rushes lay on the floor. A small, low table stood in one corner. In another corner was a large pallet of hay. The place had a rank, close smell of sweat and ale that made me feel slightly ill, used as I was to open air. Bear fluffed up the pallet. Bear? What? This building. It's so high. Might, might it fall down? He looked at me for a disbelieving moment, then erupted with one of his big laughs. There is no chance. None. There was a knock at the door. Widow Daventry entered. In her hands was a bowl with meat and thick sauce. Pieces of bread were mixed in. To my surprise, she offered it to me. I took it gratefully. Yours is below, she said to Bear, and left. I sat on the hay cross-legged, bowl in my lap, horn spoon in hand. As Bear moved his dagger and laid it on the table, I said, "'Will we perform here?' I asked. "'I think not,' he said to my further surprise. "'Our time here will be very short. "'But I must show you something.' He went to the wall and felt about the wooden boards. "'This is a special room,' he said. "'My friend below always gives it to me.' Under the pressure of his hands, a slab of wood popped out from the wall. "'It's a hiding place. "'It will hold you and me too, for that matter, if there's a need.' "'Will there be a need?' "'By all of heaven's sacred saints, I pray not.' Bear, I said, looking directly at him. What is it you really do? He laughed. When we met, he said, you dared not even ask my name. Now you stare brazenly at me and presume to ask my affairs? Have we risen in the world or fallen? That's for you to say, I said. As to what I really do, he said with a placating smile, I am a fool because I should like to be in heaven before I die. He reached for the door. I don't want to stay here, I said. It's close and ill-smelling. You'll do as you're told. Yes, master, I said, knowing my saying so would irritate him. Then at least please don't lock the door. I won't, he said, then paused. For a moment, I thought he would speak more, but all he said was, Crispin, on your life, remain here until I return. And with that, he left. Feeling much aggrieved, I ate the food, then lay back on the straw and was not very happy. Why, I asked myself, should I remain in such a stuffy place while he did as he pleased? Besides, my glimpses of the town had only whetted my curiosity, and I had a penny of my own. There was much still to see, but it sounded as if Bear intended to keep me in the room for what now appeared to be a short stay. For a while I remained where I was, though as time passed I fretted more and more. Finally, I got up, went to the door, and peeked into the hall. Seeing no one about, I made up my mind to wander the town for a short time. My intent was that I would return before Bear even noticed I had left. I was just about to leave when I went to the table and plucked up Bear's sheathed dagger and hid it underneath my tunic. Had he not taught me to use it? Was not this the town in which to claim my liberties? Moving quietly, I crept halfway down the stairs and listened. From somewhere, I could hear the murmurs of Bear's talk as well as Widow Daventry's. Exactly where they were, I didn't know. I continued down until I was certain no one was in the tavern room. At the base of the steps, I decided it would be better if I didn't use the front door, lest they see me. Instead, I made a sharp turn and went along a narrow hall. At the end of it, I reached a small door. Pushing it open, I stepped into an alley that had the most appalling stench. It was the place where privies were set over open ditches. 
Holding my nose, I shut the door behind me and raced away.